Uh, many of you don't know my background, but um, I was born a poor black child in southeast Wisconsin. No, that's, that was, uh, that was uh, Steve's joke. Anyway, uh, no, uh, but I did come from a uh, low-income family, southeastern Wisconsin, just a regular kind of guy raised in the country, started working on a farm when I was 10. So the only uh, thing I could do really was either to go to college or go to the service when I graduated from high school, and I chose to go in the Air Force, and I spent 23 years as an Air Force meteorologist before I retired from the military of command's inspector general staff at Scott Air Force Base. On, in 1976, I returned from a two-year assignment to the island of Guam, where I was a weather forecaster, weather, a meteorologist on Guam, providing weather to support to all traffic traveling east and west. We got there after the arc light bombings in Vietnam, but we did were able to see the memorial and, and uh, hear the stories about the B-52s lost in crashes after takeoff and and all that our service members do to provide safety for and freedom for us here in this country. On returning to Guam, and, uh, I was assigned to the Global Weather Center Special Projects Branch and immediately frozen there at, uh, at, at off at Air Force Base for five years. But upon arrival back, my wife and I, uh, Carol, uh, my first wife and I, were talking about wanting a better background for our boys. We had our second boy was born at the Navy Hospital in Guam, which was probably kind of an omen because he's, a, he's now a captain in the United States Navy. So uh, we were looking around for a church to go to. We wanted a better church background. We wanted them to grow up being taken to church and not just going to church on their own if they chose to do so as Carol and I had done. And so we started looking around, and it just so happens that we befriended the, our neighbors next to us in South Omaha, and uh, she had been in a number of beauty pageants, but uh, she had a friend in, in, in the South, in Georgia, I think, in Georgia, Alabama, had sent her a note that said, hey, there's a, a church in Bellevue, Nebraska that you need to go to. And it happened to be the Bellevue Church of Christ. So uh, Carol said, would that be okay if, I, if Dee uh, and I went to church Sunday, Sunday morning? Yeah, that'd be fine. So I babysat the kids. I was not working at that time. Uh, we, do, the work that I did, we split a 12-hour shift, um, six days on, three days off. So I happened to be off at that time. And um, so Carol and, and Dee Downs attended the church, attended church, and when she came back, I asked her about it, and how, what she thought of it. She said it, it was um, different than anything I've ever been to before. She said they don't have music there. They don't believe in music in this, in this church. But she said the people, somebody was always coming up and introducing themselves to me, and I felt comfortable there. I said, okay. So she said to me, uh, they have church tonight. I said, they have church tonight? She said, yeah, they have church Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night, and they have a ladies' Bible class on Tuesday. I said, okay, well, um, okay, that's really nice. She said, well, can we go tonight? So we went that night. And then we went Wednesday, and then we went Sunday morning and Sunday night, and, and on and on down the road. I don't, unless I was working, we did not miss a session. When the doors were open, we were there. And it was about probably four weeks later that we had a knock at the door, and it was um, Smith Kite, who was our preacher. Uh, I don't know if many of you may, you may not know him, but you may know his nephew, Tom Kite, who used to be a PGA golfer, or maybe is still a PGA golfer. But um, Tom Kite, and then one of the brothers from here, Frank Montag, former sojourner, has since passed, came to visit us at the house and sat down and talked with us and asked us if we had any questions. No. Um, 
do we, did we understand what, what the uh, process was, what the steps of the gospel were, uh, how, how to become a Christian, how to be baptized into Christ. We weren't really clear on that. Though we had been reading, I had, we would read the Bible, we'd take turns reading the Bible in bed before we went to sleep every night. And so, although we were getting some of it, we didn't have all of it. So they talked with us about that, and, and, and uh, Smith was such a, a great evangelist. But they talked with us about that, and we must have visited for about an hour. And so... Uh, Smith said, well, what do you think? And uh, Carol and I said, I, we, we want to be baptized into Christ. We want to be sure that should anything happen, as the brother said, Tom said yesterday, it was kind of a fear thing. What, can, what would keep you from being with God for eternity? What are those things that you need to put out of your life that would keep you from being brought home to heaven. And so at that point, we decided that we would be baptized. So we were baptized, that was in late August, 1976, um, last century. And um, there were a number of people that were baptized about that same time, a number of ladies that were baptized about that same time. And there had to have been something in the water because Four of the women baptized during that summer were pregnant. And the, the, the great thing is that my wife, Carol, uh, had difficulty. She lost two babies early on in our marriage and uh, uh, miscarried and, and had a terrible time getting pregnant. And then she had doctors tell her that she would never be able to carry a baby full term. She had doctors tell her that if she did carry a baby full term, the baby would possibly die during delivery or Carol would die during delivery. So with all of these things facing us, we did not stop trying to have children. And so with James, our oldest child, who was a doctor at Chinute Air Force Base, I don't know if you're familiar with the term, shoot me, don't Chinute me. Uh, <laughs> Chinute Air Force Base is in the middle of nothing at Rantoul, Illinois, just north of Champaign-Urbana where the University of Illinois is. But, but anyway, so uh, the doctor there told Carol, said, you got all the equipment, we'll get it working. And sure enough, they did. And our oldest son was born in Montana. But after that, they told her she couldn't take the medication anymore to allow her to become pregnant didn't matter because he was in charge. God was in charge of our lives at this point. And she got pregnant with Todd, our youngest son, carried him full term with no issues. As a matter of fact, she was in the hospital. Uh, God is so good. She was in the hospital because she was scheduled to have a partial hysterectomy when we found out she was pregnant. And my mother-in-law had come down to be with the kids so that I could be with her visit her at the hospital pretty regularly and help her through this. So I had dropped her off at the hospital the day, night before surgery and I got a phone call and talked to her and she, she said to me, she said, we need to talk. I said, okay. Um, I said, you a little bit nervous about the surgery? She said, uh, no, there's not gonna be a surgery. I said, what, what? She said, um, I'm pregnant. I said, what? <laughs> my mother-in-law is sitting there and I said okay I'll be right there and so I hung up the phone and got ready to leave and my mother-in-law said what's going on she said uh, or I said uh, well um, the surgery's off uh, Carol's pregnant she said what couldn't you have taken better care <laughs> So she was kind of upset with me at that point, but holding that little baby in her hands helped, I think. But this was part of God's providence. He, he watched out for her. He knew the difficulties that she had had in having previous pregnancies and watched out for her. 
and they had not done a pregnancy test prior to her being admitted to the hospital. So the doctor, who, who the surgeon, who was a member of the church, said, well, we need to check one more thing. And God watched out for my wife and our son. God has been with me through the time of my life, my rebirth. I had the opportunity at Bellevue, Nebraska to be taught and be brought into the Amen Ministries. That's American Military Evangelizing Nations, started by Don Yelton and a number of other brothers and was originally based out of White's Ferry Road Church of Christ in West Monroe, Louisiana. And worked with them, they taught me, uh, they, they brought me to be able to go out and give sermons. I remember, I very distinctly remember the first opportunity I had to preach Christ was at a, a church in Irwin, Iowa. And I had worked this lesson and worked this lesson and worked this lesson. And the only thing that I didn't do was have one of the other brothers review the lesson. And I didn't present it to somewhere else. So I went and I presented this lesson and they all, I was always told, you know, be to the point, deliver your message well, let them understand that it's all about Christ and bringing lost souls to Christ and the uh, opportunity to share Christ with others in the community and how that outre outreach can work. And well, it appears that I did all of that in uh, five minutes. <laughs> so the lady we were gonna, supposed to go have lunch with that day um, she told me later, she said, I'm sitting in the back of the room going, the roast is not going to be done. The roast is not going to be done. <laughs> the other thing that God showed me is the importance of listening. So as I was standing by the door and the people were going out, I would say, how are you doing? And how are you doing today? And how are you doing today? And and this one lady said, well, I'm not doing too well. And I said, well, that's, that's excellent. Have a good day. And I said, I said, no, wait, well, wait a minute. And I went back to her. She had stepped a couple of steps away. And I went back to her and I took her hand again. And I said, I want to apologize. Because although I was listening and I got your message, my mouth didn't understand that. Is there anything we can do to make your day better? How, is there something we can do to help you? She said, no. She said, I'm just, it was an older lady, much older than you ladies in the audience, I'm sure. But uh, it was an older lady. And she took that pass off as natural. And so I, I told her, I said, I am so sorry that you're not feeling well but I will pray for you. And um, you'll be in my thoughts because I, I did not do you the service I should have. So I said, bless you and have a good day. And, and I, I have thought about that from that day on. I still catch myself listening, but not my mouth just does not get connected to the brain to understand and reflect on what I heard Every now and then, it's kind of like the blind squirrel. They'll get a nut every now and then. But um, so I, it, he has blessed me in understanding my shortcomings and understanding how I need to work harder to be better, to be the man that he wants me to be. So we went to Turkey in 1981. After my freeze came off, uh, they wanted to send me up to the DMZ in Korea. And I, so I've got three young boys now that I'm, I need to be home to help my wife raise. And I went, to, I got a hold of personnel. I said, there's got to be something else you can do. You could have gotten me. I, I tried to go to Vietnam twice, turned down. I, I could have gone to Korea before I got married. No, not, not that. That would have been way too simple. And then, uh, but I said, so there's got to be something else you can do. I've got three young boys that I need to my, be with my wife to help her raise. They said, well, you could go back to Turkey 
I had been in Turkey <laughs> as an 18-year-old. I did not get to Injilik Air Base that first try. I had to stay overnight in Istanbul. Never been outside of the United States before in my life. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I sat straight up out of bed when a guy was calling the Muslims to prayer because the minaret was about a block from my hotel. So I really heard what he was saying. Didn't understand a word of it, but as an 18-year-old boy that had never been anywhere before, scared to death. So I said, yes, I'll do that. And I took my family with me. I became the endorsed authority. When you're having, trying to have worship services on a base, you have to have somebody who is the endorsed authority, somebody that the base can connect with, somebody that is a point of contact or the person of responsibility or the person that can uh, be talked to if there's an issue with any of your people that are meeting there. And so I was the endorsed authority, endorsed by the same people that endorsed the Church of Christ chaplains for the military. And we came into that congregation, there were 12 people and five of them were my family. And there, I had been told before on the way over there, I had been told by different people that had been there, said, yeah, they have a large group that meets there. So I was kind of astounded. And I found that there was a, a split in the church before we got there that was caused by things that people in the church, are, and actually people in life shouldn't be doing, let alone brothers and sisters in the church have no means, no reason, no possible, they shouldn't even be thinking about things like that, let alone accomplishing them. I don't care that it's a remote location way out there from the United States, just because we are not like the, the Muslims when they fly out of the Middle East, they take their habib, habjibs off, oh, I can't even pronounce the word, but they take them off and put on jewelry and short skirts and act like they're just other people. They do not act like Muslims when they're not in a Muslim country, except for the most part. Seen it on air, aircraft all the time. We are human, yes. We will sin, yes, otherwise Christ wouldn't have had to die for us. But we need to be better than that. So anyway, we studied with people. I had access to the, the people that were on the base that were listed as their, their church or religious preference was Church of Christ. And so I started to meet with them. And as new Christians would come in, being the key man for Amen, I was a contact point and we would meet with them. Uh, we were doing very well. We had, uh, my wife and I lived in a um, <laughs> 10 by 40 trailer with a 12 by 40 uh, cabana on the side. But on Tuesday night, you could come to the Little John house and you're probably either gonna have spaghetti or chicken or something like that. Hamburgers maybe, hot dogs, I don't know, but we would have the people in the living room and uh, the floor would be covered, the couch, the chairs covered, and we would hand the plates around. You always use paper plates, always use paper plates, easier to take care of. But, and we would have a meal together for the singles that were there at Injerlik that were members of the church. But uh, so coming to Christ in Bellevue gave me a great opportunity to help the church overseas, and not only at Injerlik, but we moved on up to Nuremberg then, and I was, I was a endorsed authority at Pinder Barracks in Zerndorf, Germany, and in Grafenwehr, Germany when we moved up there. So. The six years we spent in Europe, that, that, uh, that set of assignments, I, I hope that we did great work. I hope that we served God the way he wanted us to serve him. Um, never before had anybody from the Injerlich congregation gone to Berchtesgaden, Germany, where the annual Church of Christ retreat in Europe is held, or was held. 
I'm not sure where they're doing it now because Berktus Garden, the General Walker Hotel, has been given back to the Germans. But uh, to be sitting in the auditorium in Berktus Garden, Germany, when they're singing, it's both German and American members of the church. We had a, a fellow who was uh, an opera singer from Würzburg, Germany, that would come. And you would have five and six hundred people in that auditorium singing praise to God. Man, this guy could carry a tune. He was amazing. He was amazing. It reminded me a lot of Paul Hutcherson, amazing singer. Uh, but anyway, uh, so we had that opportunity, and I took a group of six of us. We flew up military air to Rhine Main, and we hooked up with the Rhine Main, the uh, one of the Frankfurt congregations of the church, and traveled south then to Birch's Garden with them. They made room for us on their chartered bus, and uh, so we got down there and, and and went through that experience, and we got back, and I brought that experience back to the church and lit another fire in the church in Injerlich, and it grew. And in the two years I was there, we went from 12 to 60. I had a note from, I had a letter from a woman in New Mexico, I think, I don't remember what city, but she was concerned because her daughter's boyfriend was in Diyarbakir, Turkey. And could I possibly go to Diyarbakir and baptize him into Christ? And unfortunately, I, I didn't have to because within about three days of receiving that letter, uh, one of the airmen working, and I was the chief weather station operations there at the base, one of the airmen working up front came back and said, you have a visitor? And I said, well, show him back. So brought him back to the office. It was the young man, Sergio Says, who was stationed at Diyarbakir, got on a Turkish bus, rode it all the way to, to Adana, Turkey, took the bus shuttle out to the base to come and be baptized. We baptized him that day in the pool at Injilic Air Base, okay? We were not beyond baptizing people in the pool. We could find a bathtub that was long enough. At, at, at Berktus Garden, they have these big concrete bathtubs. If you're eight feet tall, you can still be baptized in one of those bathtubs. I mean, it's, it's incredible. But we would also take people down and baptize them in the med. We did that one November, and then we tried to, tried to get away from doing that in, no, in the winter months. <laughs> because the med, even though you're farther south, it's still cold. Anyway. So I came back to the, back to the United States after doing this evangelistic work in Europe. And I let, I let my, our God down because I came back to a congregation where there were military members and they were doing so much work, I didn't do anything. I became a pew warmer and I let our God down. But I finally figured out that by not going to church Sunday morning, I wasn't feeling any better. I was feeling uh, lost, wandering. Uh, what could I do? How could I fix this? And so I got back to going back to church and trying to find projects. If they had a work day, I would, I would try to make sure I was available to do that, trying to get better. And I, and I started to increase the amount of study that I was doing. And it was about that time that we lost our oldest son. The uh, police report said it was suicide because that's what the woman that was with him told him it was. But if you read the police report, it says there was a gun in his left hand. The coroner's report said it was a right to left gunshot. I think she killed him and got away with it. And I fell off the wagon again. I crawled into a hole 
but God brought me out of it because he showed me that I wasn't the one that was really hurting. My wife was inconsolable. She had been civil service for 17 years and she would go to work and just sit at her desk and cry all day. So she had the opportunity to, uh, they were having a drawdown in civil service. She had an opportunity to cash out, so she did. And I took care of her for the next 19 years. I did everything. I made sure she had clean bed. I made sure she had clean linen. I made sure she had a bath or a shower every day. I made sure I took care of, I took control of her medication because she had over medicated a couple of times and I was not going to have to explain to my two sons why their mother was gone as well. I took care of her for 19 years. We were married for 49 years before she went home. Lost her to uh, uh, fatty liver disease. She was not a candidate for a transplant, a transplant and her kidneys failed and they just couldn't keep the water off of her, the liquid off of her, fluid out of her body, even with dialysis. They would do dialysis and two hours later it would be back because there was no way of evacuating the fluid from her body. So, the loss of my son got me back studying, but I was caring for my wife and working a full-time job and I wasn't doing much evangelism. I would talk, anytime I had an opportunity to talk to somebody about Christ, I would. I would get in Bible discussions at work or in the grocery line. What, and you know where, you know the opportunities we have. Uh, I did not become a Mike Luisi where I, every time I sit down in a restaurant, I talk to the waitress and, and try to convert her right there as she's serving the water. No, but Mike, I think that's a fantastic thing and I, I praise God for that. Bless you, brother, for doing that. I've seen the results of what that does Okay, but I was back so that I could, I quit, I quit work and I was with my wife the last eight months of her life every day. And I thank God for that, for showing me how to do that, showing me how to be compassionate to her, showing me how to set aside the pain that I felt. for allowing me to be there to help her through. So, that was, uh, that was October of 2018. And um, I started wandering around. I was gonna start riding motorcycles again. And I made two mistakes after my wife died. Two mistakes. The first one was to tell my son, who has now become my parent, my youngest son, that I was thinking about, my, I was looking at a 2006 Harley Softail. <laughs> yeah, I agree with you, Chuck. <laughs> but he said, Dad, that's not appropriate for a man your age. <laughs> I didn't even have my cane or my walker yet, folks. And so he said, well, you always wanted to have a tra travel trailer, and why don't you buy a travel trailer? Well, so I did. So I bought a Forest River tow behind, or a tag along, I guess some of you call them, uh, a Salem, and a, a beautiful, beautiful trailer. Uh, it was just not gonna be big enough for the work we, were, we do here, for, for me. That's, that's for me, Chris, that's not saying that your trailer's not big enough, I'm just saying, for me, that was the, that was the way it was. Uh, so, 
Then the guy that I'm renting from, I had, I had sold our house when, when I had to stop work. I sold our house so that we could, be, we could reduce the, our, our outlay so that I could take care of Carol and we rented a, a property. And so about the time I got my trailer, uh, the guy that owned the property said he was wanting to sell that to his niece. So I said, okay, and I, I went and I rented a storage space to put a uh, big storage space, honey. You, should, you would have been proud I would, that I had a place other than a house to store all my stuff in. So I had the storage space all lined up, and I was, Todd had invited me over for dinner. He said, what you been doing? He said, oh, I said, well... I got my, I, I rented a storage space. He said, really, what you doing with that? I said, well, I'm gonna put all the, the household goods in it. And uh, I'm, then I'm going down to Texas. I, I got an opportunity with the Corps of Engineers at, at um, Sha Sha what's the name of that? Hickory Creek, Hickory Creek Camp Ground is on uh, Louisville Lake. So I was gonna go down there and be a camp host and it wouldn't cost me anything to live and just, just enjoy life. I had a buddy who lives down there, good friend that we spent a lot of years with, and I was going to do that. And then um, <laughs> he said, Dad, it's not appropriate for a man your age to be living out of a travel trailer. <laughs> Folks, we've only been home 26 days this year, okay? We will be home in November and December, and then we'll be gone again. And I'm not sure exactly when we're going to get back to Illinois after that, okay? So, appropriate to be full-timers? I don't think he understands what's going on. So he started sending me pictures of houses that were for sale. He said, you need to be your own landlord. So I bought a house, and that's the storage unit that we have in Illinois right now. But <laughs> because, once again, he said, that's not appropriate for a man your age. I don't tell my son what I'm getting ready to do anymore. Do I, Dana? No, no. <laughs> we decided, um, well, let me, let me do this first. So I started looking around because I realized that if I did not have some adult supervision, I was not probably going to make it very long. And I found on eBay, I found this young lady. <laughs> I mean, no, no, not eBay. It was eHarmony. <laughs> friends of ours, uh, the friends of ours back in Illinois, uh, well, she's, now she lives in Dawsonville, Georgia, and uh, we just lost her husband. And, uh, and the Kirk family, Mike and Jane Kirk. Um, Mike was an uh, F4 backseater during his time in the service. And, and good friend. Um, I miss him dearly, and I'll be glad when I can see him again. But I'm not in, I'm not in any hurry, boss. I'm not in any hurry. Um, but um, good friend. Anyway, uh, the ladies had asked. They knew that I was engaged, and the ladies had asked if Dana would wanted to come up and go to the ladies' uh, retreat with them. And I thought, most of these ladies have known me a long time. This is not going to end well. Well, no, and I was totally wrong uh, because it did. And she had a great time, and they took her under their wing, and they love her dearly. And one of the ladies had asked Jane Kirk, said, well, how did Bob and Dana meet? Well, you'd have to know Jane, but she's, she's a lovely lady, a sweet lady. Sometimes she's not real quick, though. And so she said, well, it was e, um, e, um, eBay. They met on eBay. And so that, that's always been a joke. But anyway, we, we had met on eHarmony, and the uh, first time that we had contact with each other, I gave Dana my telephone number, and it was a good thing. And I'll show you God's providence, because my eHarmony account got hacked, and we had been talking just the night before. They pulled my profile. And Dana sent me a text on my phone, said, did I say something wrong? And I called her right away. I said, what's going on? She said, well, your profile's gone. And I said, no, you didn't say anything wrong. And so I was, like I said, I was planning on going to Texas 
So I told her, I said, yeah, I should be down there in June. And, uh, well, I, I should be down there in July. And when August came around, it was her birthday, so I flew down and uh, took her out for her birthday. And that night we talked way into the night. And I told her about what I, you know, how you, when you meet someone, uh, you newly married uh, sojourners, you understand that, that that's what the process. You meet someone, you tell them about your background. Try to make them comfortable. You try to make it so that when they finally figure out that you are, in fact, uh, an ex-con, it doesn't matter. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, so we talked into the night and... Uh, Toward the end, uh, I got to know about her, and she got to know about me, and toward the end, uh, it was kind of quiet, and it was about time I suppose to go to bed, and I said, well, what do you think? And Dana said to me, I want to know your God. So the next day, we, got, we went out and bought her a, a Bible, and I went to the Bible bookstore with her, and I went through all the different translations, and she found one she was comfortable with. We bought that, and we did the Ivan Stewart open, open Bible study. And at the end of the third lesson, I asked her, what do you think? And she said, I want to be baptized. And we had attended the Rock Hill Church while we were there. So... I asked her, I said, well, should I get a hold of the elders and we'll go over to Rock Hill and have you baptized? She said, no. I said, well, what then? She said, I want to be baptized in our church up in Illinois. And so we were. We were she was baptized in October. And um, we were married in December. And Mike Kirk, one of the elders, did this wedding ceremony there. And she has been such a blessing to me. Providence of God to bring me a woman who is desiring to know more about God and to serve his family. I couldn't be more blessed. So we need to understand. I, I have to keep right in the front of my mind that God doesn't leave us ever. That single set of footprints in the sand is his, not ours. We are never alone. And, well, by the way, we can't outgive God either. That doesn't happen. But God loves us, and he's there for us. We just have to ask. He knows what we need, but... He gives us free will. We have to ask. So, in, in ending, long story, I know, I'm sorry. But in ending, I want you to know that I'm a guy that is a lead, follow, or get out of the way kind of a guy. I am also a mission oriented guy. And as long as I can, I will not leave this mission. Thank you.